Hello everyone, welcome back to another Bible study and episode review in Shady Oak Ministries. I'm of course Shady Oak, and today we're going to be discussing episode 21 of season 8 of the TV show My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, the episode A Rock Hoof and a Hard Place. Now, Shady agree with Yona that the Rock Hoof is best pony. However, <laughs> his message is almost better than his antics, because while this was definitely an entertaining episode to be sure, especially one of... Celtic origin as myself, his life story served as an invaluable resource to the School of Friendship because it gave them first-hand inspiration to know the true value of history, which is something another written record also serves for us as Christians, and that, of course, is referring to the Bible. Today, I want to discuss three things with you in association with today's episode, giving us the opportunity to discuss these biblical themes, not only to meet on this common ground, but with this familiar territory to discuss things that probably wouldn't come up with otherwise, that wouldn't come up in the conversation, rather, otherwise. The first thing I want to discuss concerning the Bible and its nature as not only the same role that Rakuf was able to fulfill as one of the pillars of ancient Equestria, but it also is going to build on this theme that we need to understand as Christians if we're going to know that we know that we know that Christianity is built on fact, on history, not on fables and feelings something that too many fall into, and something that I hope to prevent from happening, not only to those on the outside looking in, if you're a non-Christian, and want to know what our beliefs are, that it's not just a collection of fables that were shared among people that made them feel good at night, but it's also a collection of something that actually happened in history and confirms to us very important things. In fact, some of the most important things. Does God exist? Does he care about us? How do we know what is true and what isn't in regards to religion? The first thing I'm going to discuss with you all here today are the people of Scripture. Who were the people God used throughout history? The second is the preservation of Scripture. How do we know this is history and not just tall tales? And third, the purpose of Scripture. Why does God tell us about the lives of people, like the pillars of Equestria, thousands of years before our own? What benefit do we have of hearing these stories, these historical records even? Well, that's what I'd like to start with. First, let's go to the people of Scripture. Why is the nation of Israel's history so important for us to understand as Christians across the world? Well, simply this, God made Israel a promise. They are the living example of whether or not God can be trusted to keep his promises or not. When we describe God as faithful, the word faith means trust with reason, and I'll reinforce that point in a second. But if I'm faithful, if faith means trust with reason, if you're full of faith or considered a faithful person, it means you're full of trust, you're worth investing your trust in. And if I'm going to then say, okay, what was the promise that God made in the Old Testament? Plenty could be pointed to as examples of God's trustworthiness, but I think the one that's most relevant to us today is whether or not we're going to heaven or hell. Salvation from sin in the Old Testament was this. I'm going to send my son. Do you believe that promise? Well, by faith, if you believe that, you're saved. And once again, what does that word mean? Trust with reason. With the reasons that you have, are you willing to trust God's ability to forgive your sins on the basis of the one he would send in the future? Well, that's how salvation in the Old Testament worked. And anyone who simply trusted in that promise with the information that they had, they were saved. And the same is true for the New Testament, but just under a different time frame. What reasons do I have to trust that God did send his son? And by trusting that God sent his son and that through him I am forgiven, that I am going to heaven on the basis of his goodness, not my merit, I am saved. So really the only difference between the Old and the New Testament as far as getting saved from your sin goes, by the way, sin meaning just imperfection to miss, it was an archery term that just meant you didn't hit the bullseye. Now you could be that troll that was just trying to, you know, give the counselors a hard time at summer camp and just deliberately miss with your arrow, or you could have been deliberately trying to hit the bullseye and missed. But either way, 
all of us have missed that mark of God's perfection. So the only solution then available to us is the one God gave to us. And if you were before Jesus coming, you looked forward to it. That was salvation. If you are after Jesus coming, like we all are today, that is how we receive his promises, by looking back and remembering, recognizing that's what God did to save me. Just like those in the Old Testament said, that's what God's going to do to save me. And the animal sacrifices were just reinforcements and illustrations of this point. But again, faith is oftentimes an overused word. And I'm trying to dispel that tendency among Christian circles to use all of these ceremonious Old English or just overly complex terms that most people aren't going to track with, including the one saying them, and just bring them into their simple definition. Terms like sin, it means to miss. Miss what? God's standard of perfection. What do we mean by faith? Trust with reason. Well, understand as well, there are plenty of examples of people who trusted God with reason, even if it was just a little, in the Old Testament. And if we look at the reasons they had available to them, Cain looked to the legacy of his parents and said, look, they had it good when they had a relationship with God. I want that restored. Did I say Cain? Abel had wanted to see what his parents once had. He actually committed himself to a relationship with God. His older brother, Cain, wasn't so keen on that as a priority. But understand this as well. It goes on. We're told about Noah, who despite not being a perfect guy, had some problems with alcohol. He was told by God something that he had no reason to believe otherwise. But because God said it, and because when he was born, Adam was still alive at the time, he was able to see firsthand, look, great-great-great-granddaddy Adam, he had something with God that we have all lost. And when he said something to him, when he made a promise to my great-great-great-grandma Eve, that he would one day do something about it, I want to be a part of that. And frankly, everything that I've seen apart from God has not really been productive, let alone peaceful. It says, at the time of Noah, everyone was not only doing what was right in their own eyes, but what was right was to bash the head in of anyone who even spiked any sort of emotional frenzy. It was basically the world was a YouTube comment section. You're, you're getting the illustration. We look at Abraham. He was living in the metropolis of the time, the Babylonian city of Ur. And I know the name's simplistic, but the city wasn't. As far as the time goes, it was the, be- it was the New York City of its day. And yet, despite this, God came to him and said, I want you to go to live in a tent, basically, for the rest of your life. Travel all the way across the Middle East and go to the land that I have prepared for you. And he said, you know what? All the other gods were just excuses to, you know, support my bad habits. But this is a God that's actually expecting something of me. And I trust that he's going to deliver. Because if he is who he claims to be, he's fully capable of providing me a son. He's fully capable of making me a father of many nations. The name Abraham was what he was renamed after he trusted God's promise to give him a son and a land where his children would one day grow. Lot, Abraham's nephew, that guy was far from perfect, but he recognized that despite the way that he and those around him were living their lives, that God was the better option. And it tore him up inside. That alone was enough for God to consider him right in a relationship with him. Jacob, his name meant cheater, but God renamed him Israel. Why? Because despite his tendency to take things into his own hands throughout his entire life, he knew that God ultimately was the one who would see him through anything that he found himself in. Now, I know it took some persuading, a night of wrestling, but it nonetheless was where he ended up. And that promise that he would bless his 12 sons, simply believing that, God said, that guy's in a right relationship with me. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because he recognizes I still have a plan for his kids. That's all he expects from you and me. We look at Joseph. That guy went through a really, really tough life. But ultimately, where did it put him? And notice that he was thanking God for the results before he even saw them. Notice that despite his circumstances, he said, I'm going to be, okay, I was sold by my brothers as a slave in Egypt. I'm going to be the best slave ever. I'm going to be God's slave in Egypt. Oh, well, I've been promoted to the head of the house. Oh, my master's wife 
playing the cougar role after me, makes a false accusation when I say no, gets me thrown in prison. I'm going to be the prisoner of God. I'm going to be the best prisoner that I can. And he ends up in charge of the prison, ends up learning how Egyptian culture works in the meantime. He is available to be used by God in that prison setting, and that eventually gets him set in the court of Pharaoh when God speaks to him. And when God spoke, he provided an interpretation of said dream, because that's how Pharaoh understood the gods communicated. So God said, all right, if that's what you think of what a god would do, I'll speak to you in a way that you think gods should. I'll start where you're at, but nonetheless, Joseph ended up at the head of the world-ruling superpower at the time. In fact, his policy made Egypt the world-ruling superpower of that time, getting them through the famine, making all the other surrounding nations depend on them in order to get through this time. But you follow along with these things. Judah, the fourth-born son of Jacob, and likewise the one that would carry on the messianic promise, he said, look, I spend my time with prostitutes, I got my daughter-in-law pregnant by accident, Isaiah or Genesis 37, look it up. But of all of these things that are just so wrong with me, God still made a promise to my family, and I am going to keep that promise, or rather I'm going to receive that promise and let him keep it. We look at Joshua. When Moses passed on that legacy, and he says, look, I'm no Moses Otherwise, my mom would have named me that, but I'm just going to do what God's called me to do now. And they won battles that they had no business winning. You follow along in this line. You look at the times of the judges, this list of people who on and on, read Hebrews chapter 11. It's the whole point. People who throughout history trusted God and weren't disappointed. Let, let me just read a section of it to you. Isaiah, or Isaiah, I'm saying that a lot. Hebrews 11 verse 32. What more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, and also of David and Samuel and the prophets, so the time of Judges through Second Samuel, though, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, reference to Daniel, quenched the violence of fire, also a reference to Daniel, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, reference to Gideon, Turned to flight the armies of aliens, not outer space aliens, foreigners that wanted to take over the nation. Women received their dead raised to life again, reference to Elijah. Others were, were, were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Now note, that's going through a lot for something that they haven't yet seen. But catch this. Still others had trials of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. Speaking to the Hebrews, the author of this book is speaking during a time where they're dealing with that as well. They were stoned. They were sawn in two, reference to Isaiah. They were in Jeremiah as well. He was stoned to death in Egypt with, with rocks, not weed. <laughs> they were, uh, they were, let me see, they were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, uncomfortable clothing, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. You hear that said a lot among your favorite video game characters. That's where this term came from. But they wandered in deserts and mountains, in caves and dens of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, through trusting God by reason, did not receive the promise. They didn't see the results in their lifetime. God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Now, here, here's the point that's being made here. If you aren't reminded of something, you'll forget it. That's simply the point being made. And if we, and if rather, they were made the promises and they saw them kept, did they? No, they endured lives of torture, persecution, and eventually death. But understand, the promises they were made, that they trusted God to keep, we have seen kept. Jesus is coming. They didn't see Jesus. We did. Now, therefore, since we have seen Jesus, since we saw that God kept that promise, what reason do we have to believe that he'll keep the others? There's one. In fact, there's more than one. But you understand the logic here. You look at the people as proof 
that he has always kept his promises. Because if he kept them to those in the past, he will continue to keep those in the future. What is faith again? Trust with reason. The reason we are told about the people in the Bible isn't because it's important to know the people that existed a thousand years before you. I'm sure there are blacksmiths and farmers who we will never know the names of this side of heaven, but nonetheless, were all people selected in Scripture so that we would know that when God made someone a promise, he kept it. And that most important promise is whether or not you and I are going to heaven or hell. And I think that's a very relevant one because when it ultimately comes down to it, I want to make sure that promise is one that he keeps. And based on history, I can look and see that he kept his promises before and by those reasons will trust them to be kept in the future. But again, I say history. How do we know that this is not unlike the tall tale that Rockhoof told the kids about the Ursa Major? That when he flung the bear into the <laughs> sky, I I'm not sure how the galaxy works in equestrian terms with the sun rotating and all that. But nonetheless, it while, while the fur definitely has some star constellations on it, he acknowledged that it was just a tall tale. Therefore, not necessarily true, but also not necessarily false, perhaps embellished, but still nonetheless worth sharing. Is that what the Bible is? Well, allow me to clarify what the Bible actually means as a word. The word Bible is an Anglican term, and it actually means the books. This collection of books, 66 in fact in total, had over 40 different authors that spanned and were written over 1,500 years of human history. The original first five books of Moses were written from 1450 to 1410 BC. The 40 years in the wilderness, the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy, were written obviously at the end of those 40 years. You can't recall history if you haven't been through it, unless you're doing prophecy, but that would apply in Deuteronomy as well. The books of Joshua going all the way through 2 Kings covered Israel's foundation going all, obviously from 1410 all the way to the 1000s and then going onward. During the Psalms, they were written during this time. The superscription cite which one took place at which time in history, whether it was written by David when he was in the cave, good example, when he was running from Saul, or during the time of the coup of Absalom. This was all in the 10th century BC. All these things that we can date and verify. But understand as well, these books were collected and preserved and held to the standard as to which books are in the Bible and which aren't. Like, for example, the book of Jasher is mentioned in the Bible, but it's not in our Bibles. Why? Because the Jews were writing other books. But there's a difference between a history book and a historical book that was inspired by God. Now, how did they decide which books were inspired by God and which weren't? Did they flip a coin and say, oh, I guess God made the coin flip? No. They literally held it to the standard of the first man that they publicly could confirm and know was God's spokesman. That was Moses. If they were accurate in their information, because God's going to obviously get his facts straight, if they were consistent in the God they were talking about, because you can tell the truth about God, but if you're talking about a different God, then it's not the God we want to hear about. It's not the true and living God. It's a false God. We need, obviously, accountability if someone says, I'm speaking the name of God. Oh, I, I didn't hear this, though. I got it from someone else. Well, understand, if you look at what damage cults have done to this world, not just in an immediate sense, but in an eternal sense, taking the word of God and twisting it to the profit of just some con man who wants to either make a, a reputation for himself or, <laughs> for all intents and purposes, just surrounded himself with the wrong people, we're talking about an individual that has literally sent hundreds, if not millions, in some cases, to hell. Which is why Israel dealt with this matter so seriously. In fact, so seriously that if you were tested as a prophet and were found to fail any of those tests, you were lying in the name of God, because of the ongoing consequences that would cause, it was a capital offense. They would literally stone you to death. Throw, toss you over a cliff and drop huge rocks on you until you were dead. Now understand this as well. When this standard was upheld, in not just accountability, but also of miracles, that God will back up his words with deeds, 
this standard was what put certain books in their Bibles and other books apart from their Bibles. Now, now of course, they had the Talmud and the Mishnah and all these other commentaries that they wrote on the Bible. But the Bible in of itself remained the core foundation of Jewish culture, agnosium, going throughout and even beyond what would supposedly have been, and what was supposed to be rather, by every other standard, their history. Because understand this, there's a rule as far as nationalities are concerned that a nation is not going to preserve their cultural identity apart from a defined homeland where they're surrounded by and immersed in their culture and their people for more than three generations. So when you're kids and your grandkids and your great-grandkids remember what it was like to be in your country but will ultimately have gotten used to and adapted to where they are living now a culture is just going to lose its foundations yet for whatever reason the Jewish nation actually started apart from their homeland with the man named Abraham and likewise living in Egypt for several centuries until going to the promised land Israel met its foundations with the Bible, with Moses, apart from the promised land. Once they moved into the promised land, they had to spend 70 years in exile because they didn't listen to God's commands and were fully aware of the consequences. Yet coming back after one generation separate, they didn't lose anything. Just read the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. But also understand as well, in 70 AD, that is in the modern day, right? They saw the temple destroyed and under Roman occupation were dispersed throughout the Roman Empire. So not only did they no longer have a homeland, but they were not in association with each other, at least within large groups. You were lucky if more than a dozen Jews were going to populate any region of the Roman Empire, any of the sections at any given time. They were spread out and they were without a homeland. And yet to this day, I look at my map and I see the nation of Israel not only returned, but wherever I see a Jew, I see the foundations of their culture and memory preserved because it was found and established in Scripture despite all odds, despite every other nation falling apart because their identity was rooted in Scripture. It was not only preserved, but it preserved them. But understand, this isn't enough to make a historical case. When we look at the results, you can just say, well, maybe it was coincidence. Fine to acknowledge that. But understand as well, the nation of Israel is not the only reason I trust that the Bible has been preserved, that it is accurate in its recordings of history. Because understand this as well, the Bible just didn't talk about the past when it was written. It also talked about the future. The entire foundation of the Jewish culture was pointing towards a man that they called the Messiah, Mashiach in Hebrew, which means anointed one in English. And if you're curious, in Greek, Christ. They were looking forward to this Christ that would one day come, not just as a king, not just as a prophet, not just as someone who was anointed, right, for a particular purpose. The high priest was known as an anointed one. The king of Israel was known as an anointed one. Why? Because he was chosen, he was anointed for that purpose. They'd pour oil on you and they'd say, okay, you got that job now. Well, here's the interesting part. Over 300 hyper-specific prophecies that didn't only include location of birth, circumstances of birth, and conception, but going on to the political events surrounding his birth, where he would travel as a young child, under what cultural identity within Israel he would identify as, a Nazarene, when it goes into details about what kind of teaching methods he would employ, who ultimately he would represent, who he would ultimately be, when mathematically, look up Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 26, he would enter into Jerusalem, on what animal he would enter into Jerusalem, how he would be executed, see Psalm 22, as well as the book of Zechariah and others. When we look at the purpose of his execution in Isaiah 53, we can go on and on to these things where it talks in excruciating, and I mean that intentionally, detail, of his life, his birth, and his death, and his eternal reign. Interesting how you would die and yet reign forever. There must be something that happens in between. But nonetheless, 300 predictions numbering 
all talking about this Messiah, this character. And not only this, but one day a man came along from Nazareth who claimed to be that guy. Now, he was far from the first to make this claim. Just like every single claim from God, there will be people who falsely associate that claim with themselves. And that's what the majority of Orthodox, non-Christian Jews, there are Messianic Jews, those who believe that Jesus is their Messiah. We consider them a step above Christians because he's actually their Messiah. We're just benefiting from it. But understand this. Plenty of people have claimed to be the Messiah before and after Jesus. But... Like all of those people who claim to be the Messiah, the moment that they were called out on their nonsense, the moment they either made a false prophecy and were executed for it, or were caught, caught by the local governing authorities, arrested, or even executed by the local government, what happened to their followers? Well, they found a new Messiah, or they just moved on with their lives. They abandoned him because they realized he wasn't the guy. And that was the exact same thing that all of Jesus' followers did when he was arrested and crucified by the Roman government. Until three days later. And after those three days, much like those in Hebrews 11, these men were willing to go to their deaths for the sole reason that they saw this man who didn't just claim to be God, but proved it by rising from the dead. And note, not resuscitated, resurrected bodily to verify his prediction and claim that he and God were the same. Now, understand this. This wasn't something that was eventually embellished over time. According to even the most liberal and secular scholars that you could imagine, John Dominic Cross and James D.G. John, Bart Ehrman, to name a few, dozens of others that we could go on. There was, at the foundation of the Christian church, collections of people, obviously, who were literate and some who weren't, but not all of these people are going to be able to learn at the same level. Now, when you are in that kind of position, you're surrounded by people who some who can read and some who can't, you make accommodations. And so in the early church, in the book of Acts, and when the Christians were just learning about what Jesus had done, we recognize it, let's learn more about it so we can share it. They focused on a good collection. In fact, we've come to basically find out about 40, 41, I think now. You can check the work of Dr. Gary Hammerboss, who's done lots of books on this. But nonetheless, uh, 40 or more Christian creeds, little short lyrics that they would be able to recite together and remember. In the same way, before you could read or write, I'm sure you could remember Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, right? Well, being able to remember those collections of words, oftentimes associated to music as well, these were what served as the foundation of what Christians believed in the early days. And it's from these historical creeds we can not only date what time they were written, but what Christians believed at this time. Now you tell me if you think that the resurrected Jesus was A, a myth, B, not believed, and C, just something that was put upon them later, which I guess all of these are tacking on the same theme, but the accusations are made. To this creed I'm about to read to you, which was recorded for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 8. And you tell me, if Christians were reciting this within months, months of the crucifixion of Jesus, that this was something that was not believed by Christians until centuries later. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. Paul speaking to the church in Corinth in 50 AD, 20 years after Jesus' death and acclaimed resurrection, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. What scriptures? The Old Testament. That he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, that he was seen by Cephas, a nickname for Peter, then by the twelve groups. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, 
at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. Some of them have died, but you can go and ask most of them who are still alive today. After that, he was seen by James. Now, time out there for a second. James, not the apostle. James, his biological younger brother. Now, for those of you who have older siblings, if your big brother claimed to be God, what would it take to convince you that he was who he claimed to be? A resurrection from the dead would be a start. But understand this as well. James didn't believe that his older brother was Jesus until after his encounter with him, after he died. No reason, motive, or means to ever have this kind of encounter, let alone this radical life change in response to it, unless you assume otherwise beforehand. Now understand this as well. Not just James, but by all of the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me, Paul speaking also, as one born out of due time. Do you remember who Paul was? He was Saul the Pharisee. He changed his name after he became a Christian. But understand this, before he was a Christian, he was one of the people who were hunting down and exterminating Christians. And he actually got legal paper certification to go to other neighboring cities. He was on his way to Damascus after he was hunting down, imprisoning, and murdering Christians in Jerusalem, where it started. They fled taking the message with them, mind you, but they fled Jerusalem and started spreading out. And Paul says, we got to get these Christians back before this false cult spreads. And on his way to Jerusalem, he ran into Jesus. And catch this, did he have any reason to want to suddenly change all of his upbringing, all of his education, all of his life's goal and opportunity up until this point to give up his family, give up his status, give up his wealth, everything that he had going for him for the sake of something that he now realized and spent, catch this too, 14 years double checking and verifying with the eyewitnesses themselves as to whether or not it was a bad case of heat stroke or a legitimate encounter. This guy crossed his T's and dotted his eyes. He was a Christian for a reason, and it wasn't because it gave him good feelings. He lost everything because of it, but followed it because it was true, and he knew it firsthand. This creed didn't come from Paul. He delivered to that which he first received. 20 years after Jesus' death, this creed was taught in the early Christian church for the illiterate to be memorized as song lyrics so that they would understand what they were actually there to remember and share. That at a moment of history, Jesus not only came to this world, but died. Because it's hard to die if you were never born, right? But was buried and rose again the third day according to what? The Old Testament scriptures. Remember, the New Testament wasn't written before the resurrection. The resurrection is what the New Testament was written to record. Now understand this as well. Atheist, secular, modern scholars are all willing to acknowledge the basic foundations of all of these facts as history. But you also need to understand this as well. If we have this information within months of Jesus' resurrection, we also need to understand as well, how do we judge other works of ancient history, especially going 2,000 years into the past? What other people talked about this beyond Christianity? Do we at least have an acknowledgement of the basic facts of what would require a death and resurrection? Well, you can't resurrect if you haven't died. So do we at least have other people in history, historians that were within the lifetimes or at least within a century of these events who recorded them as historical fact, even alongside their own opinions on the matter. We have Romans like Tacitus. We have Greeks like Pliny the Younger. We have Jews like Flavius Josephus. We have dozens of others of people who didn't even believe who Jesus was, who in some cases hated Christians, thought they were a plague on the Roman Empire but acknowledge the core historical claims that, in, for example, in the Annals of Tacitus, he said, 
that this Christus began his following in Judea, and now it infects all of the Roman Empire. Pliny the Younger acknowledges his execution as well. Josephus references the Talmud, the writings of the Pharisees, enemies of Jesus, the one who saw him executed, who also recorded this. Note, they claimed that he was a false teacher. Otherwise, I don't think they would have crucified him. But catch that. People who were enemies of Jesus acknowledged historically that he died. If someone dies in history, does that mean they were never born? So hopefully the Jesus myth is taken out of the way. But understand that key detail that's acknowledged in history, but it goes even beyond this. Without even touching the Gospels, we have historical, reliable information from hostile witnesses. I'll define that in a second. Of people who acknowledge Jesus' existence and execution, 66% of all that we need to confirm a resurrection. But what about that last third? Well, understand as well, the claim that the Gospels that record Jesus' resurrection from the people who actually made a conclusion with the information, they can't be considered too uh, good histories because they are too late. To be written after the fact, well, firstly, how do you write history if it hasn't already happened? But secondly, the key details that are made as far as whether or not there was a resurrection or not, if you throw this out as not good history, you are ignorant of the basic rules of ancient historical criticism, or you're just being deceptive and ignoring them, which is the case for some. But understand, here's a good example. If anything over a thousand years old is going to be tested and verified, we're looking for other information, it's either going to be in really, really bad shape, or it's just not going to exist at all anymore, unless it was really well taken care of. Therefore, the kinds of artifacts, items that suggest evidence, right, and writings that we should expect to find will be few and far between. The rule is that if you find two separate sources that both talk about the same basic facts, regardless of the side details and opinions that are included within, then it's as good as gold as ancient history going that far back. There are three kinds of evidence that you can find that verify something in ancient history. The first is early testimony. The closer that your evidence is to the original event, the less likely that it's been embellished over time, right? Made into a consolation like the Ursa Major and Minor. A good example of this is Alexander the Great. Happily teach him in schools, correct? People like Aristotle, Greek, great minds, guy conquered the entire known world, Alexander the Great. Well, Plutarch's writings of the life of Alexander is the earliest that we have, and he wrote 400 years after the death of Alexander. Not during the lifetime of him or anyone who knew him, and no reason to trust him beyond the fact that it's just the first person who wrote about him. And yet, we'll happily teach that in school. Why? Because, firstly, he's not the only one who writes about Alexander. There are artifacts to confirm his writings. But as well, that's how ancient history goes. We're lucky if we find anything within centuries, plural, of the original event. We're going to go after Aristotle. We wouldn't have any reason to believe he existed other than the writings of others about him a thousand years after the fact. But I understand this as well. The first written affirmation of Jesus' resurrection, according to even atheist scholars, were written within months after his death, within the lifetimes of the original eyewitnesses, and we have discovered fragments of the Gospel of John within the first century. Look up the John Ryland fragment, P52. But understand this, this is uncanny as far as discoveries in ancient history are concerned. The second, apart from early testimony, we look for early stuff to make sure it hasn't been embellished, and we have Jesus' resurrection within the lifetimes of the eyewitnesses with artifacts and writings that we can confirm and verify existed during this time. 
but also eyewitness testimony. Now, how do we affirm that? Someone says they're an eyewitness? No, they say things that only someone who was there would recognize. For example, Frank Turek often makes this illustration in crossexamine.org. I encourage you to visit his website and make use of his resources. Don't agree with everything he says, but then again, you shouldn't. If two people agree on everything, one of them is thinking. But understand as well, we agree on the fundamental basics of how we know that our faith is based on fact. The side details can be left for another time. But the accounts and evidence that mention these things, for example, like say 9-11, the Twin Towers were destroyed September 11, 2001 in America, and that was a very significant event. Now, if I'm going to find a book about the Twin Towers, how they function as a financial center of the United States and so forth, how many people they employed, how many floors were on there, if this book included all those details but never mentions them being destroyed by a terrorist attack by flying planes into them, When would I have to assume that book was written? Before 2001. Because I think if you referenced the two towers, you'd also mention that detail. Unless it hadn't happened yet. The Gospels include information that goes well beyond the realm of expectation as far as first-hand details that only an eyewitness would be able to verify. But the perfect example is the Temple of Jerusalem. How do we know that the Gospels need to have been written before 70 AD despite the claims otherwise? Because they reference the temple. They center everything around the teachings of the temple. Jesus even predicts the destruction of the temple. But we never get the recording of when it actually happened. Josephus records it, and he said it was the war to end all wars. More Jews ended up dying from the gangs in the city than the actual Roman soldiers because of the total anarchy that broke out. The Roman soldiers started starving people. Everything was just basically the purge gone all over again. But catch this as well. When we're talking about this event in history, we're focusing on the one detail that we need to know if our faith is based on fact or fiction or not, and it starts and ends with Jesus' resurrection. If I understand that the Bible is the most reliable record that I have on that, the reliability of it doesn't just go towards the earliest testimony that we have of any other ancient work in history, not just eyewitness testimony, including details that historians would drool over if it didn't dare tell them that there was a God who actually cares about them and actually expects something from them as the foundation of morality and ethics. But we also have hostile testimony. The third detail, as far as verifiable evidence in ancient history, to know this isn't just something that some big horse told you so it must be true, but something that actually can be verified. I mentioned Tacitus, Pliny the Younger, Josephus, and there are plenty of others. There's Julius Africanus, there's plenty. I, I can go on, but people who didn't believe or support something, still admitting things about them gives another layer of reliability because your enemies aren't going to make up good or important details about you. If I made up the existence of somebody and someone who hates me also acknowledges that I made up that person, what was that person thinking? Why would they acknowledge the existence of someone that someone they hated made up? Unless... That person I made up wasn't made up, he was an actual person, and the person who hates me will at least acknowledge that. It was a real person, but didn't do nearly all the things that Shady Oak said. Well, what have we proven from that? That based on a hostile witness and an eyewitness, that person existed. Because a hostile witness would just point out that fact. Jesus never existed, what's your deal? So understand this, the Bible stands as the most reliable and well-preserved book in ancient history. The only reason people reject it isn't because of insufficient evidence, but inconvenient evidence. If Jesus actually rose from the dead, then his claims proves that there is a God and therefore His standards actually matter more than your opinion. Not just stories from one Celtic pony, but the collected accounts of over 500 eyewitnesses who all went to their deaths after enduring lives of persecution and torture for what? 
because they saw Jesus claim to be God. He said, I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to die, and I'm going to come back to life. If that is true, then God is not only real, but him acknowledging the Old Testament as reliable history is also true as well. Because if I'm going to listen to anyone's opinion, I'm going to listen to the guy who rose from the dead. And that's what brings us back to the purpose of Scripture. God's first promise was that he would undo what sin had done to us, separated us from him, introduced concepts like death, pain, despair, all these other things. When we saw that promise kept 2,000 years ago, another promise was made. He's coming back. And anyone who wants a relationship with him before then is welcome to it by simply trusting that promise. It's not something you trust without reason, and that's why he wrote it down. And as far as sharing these promises, understand that while you may not have the chance to read all of them to your friends, like Rockhoof, you can just have them look at your life and ha have them come to their own conclusions as to whether or not this is true. You couldn't have flipped a Ursa Major into the... Well, I've seen what you can do with that shovel, and that wall was no match for you. I, I actually can't believe that. It was the same point that was made in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2. You are our epistle, written on our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but the Spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on the tablets of the flesh. That is the heart. You have this information now. I encourage you not to take my word for it, but verify it. And then come to a conclusion. Not only knowing that this is true, but it makes all the difference in history. Because this is a book of history. Not just tall tales. Thank you for your time and listening to this study. If you have any sincere questions, ask them. If you'd like to encourage the ministry, do so. But most importantly, if you know someone who would benefit from hearing this study, enjoyed Rockhoof's <laughs> antics, but nonetheless wouldn't associate the historical reliability of Scripture with the way that he found his role as a storyteller, a lord keeper of Equestria, please share this study with anyone if you would be blessed by it either by the information that you've received or let me reiterate it for them. The computer's good about that. You can hit the replay button and I don't get annoyed. But thank you for your time. Remember that Jesus loves you and he's given you more than enough reasons to trust him. All that's required on your end is to come to a conclusion.